Hi, I am Annette. Welcome to Fat Girls Coping. I'm super excited to have Aria here today. We are going to be talking about trans rights um, and Black Trans Lives Matter. And so, um, Aria, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really well. Um, can you introduce yourself to the audience and let them know about your platform and what you do? Yeah. Um, so my name is Arya Saeed, um, and I am a transgender advocate based here in San Francisco, California. Um, and I'm most known for my work with uh, the Transgender District, um, which is an urban area in San Francisco's Tenderloin. Uh, that celebrates um, the lived experience, the presence, um, and culture of transgender people. Um, and it is the world's first district of its kind um, that is legally recognized. And I also lead another project called Queen Culture, um, which is all about empowerment um, and camaraderie for Black trans women. That's fantastic. I'm so happy to hear that, like, um, what is it? It's, it's trans culture. Oh, just the transgender district, yeah. Transgender district. So you said that's the first world-recognized district for trans people? It is. Um, Congrats. I actually, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, we didn't actually know that fun fact until we were doing... Um, interviews with the Daily Mail in the UK and um, they had done all their research to try to find similar efforts and yeah we're the world's first. That is incredible. Oh man look at you setting the world on fire already girl that is so <laughs> inspiring um, and so like most of these interviews all of them so far um, I am interviewing another member of Fat Girls Traveling so I'm super excited that you're a member of my community. I was able to, um, I guess, find you within the community through a pride campaign that we're doing this, uh, this year. Um, and so I was super excited to be able to kind of reach out to you for that and then to also kind of collaborate with you on other projects. But before we even got started, I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity to talk to our fellow Fat Girls Traveling members and to the world at large and just um, tell us some of your perspectives on some of the kind of hot topics or headlines that we're hearing right now. Um, and I think it's important to get your perspective. I really want to learn how to be a better ally to um, not only trans people, but like LGBT plus people, um, my disabilities, you know, advocates and people with disabilities and all of that. And so I just want to work on being a better ally all around. And I think that um, having you share your experiences and like pulling up a chair at this table is everything and it's about time. And so just first of all, super, super excited to just start this dialogue because not only is it important for me to learn, I really want to educate as many people that are willing to hear your story and just to learn more about what's going on within the trans community. Um, and so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the JK Rowling controversy. And as someone that is, you know, a Potterhead myself, I've read all of the books, seen all the movies, I've been obsessed for years. Um, it was definitely disheartening to see those headlines and see how she's been like spewing all this uh, hateful stuff towards trans people. Um, and so I wanted to kind of just get your perception on the whole thing. Um, and like the only things that I know is from what I've read. And so I want to get your perception a little bit and kind of just share what I've learned from um, reading. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it is. It, it, can we just say that it's very disappointing when people that we uh, fall in love with, um, specifically um, public figures and their craft and their contribution to the, wor to the world, um, when they disappoint us? Um, you know, I think people 
are sort of allowed to be uh, complex. And I think um, what JK Rowling is doing with her platform in particular is very violent, um, you know, towards um, a marginalized group of people, specifically with trans women, right? So the, the dialogue is an assault specifically towards um, transgender women. And I, yeah, I think she's entitled to believe whatever she wants to believe. That's the reality. Like you can't make someone sort of see your authenticity or see the value in you breathing and existing. Unfortunately, I wish everyone could see the value in all of us breathing and our differences and our shared struggles and, and the things that make us unique. And I think, um, you know, she's entitled to believe what she believes. I think she is sadly mistaken if she thinks that that uh, worldview that she has towards trans women is uh, going to liberate all of women um, or, you know, expand feminism um, towards the future and, and really having intentional conversations on how, how that rhetoric that she is spewing is actually a war against women, period. All women. Um, and that if we're not liberating um, women from all different walks of life and gender non-conforming folks um, and feminine people, um, then we're not eradicating patriarchy. We're not. And so I think, you know, the core of her belief is something that people are quite married to subconsciously, um, which is that, you know, trans women are not real women, um, that we engage in facade and that we take space and that we're mocking. And, you know, um, there's a popular space to go to that says that, you know, um, that trans women are proclaiming to know everything that, that cis female folks are going through. Um, and I think the reality is, is we, we have more shared struggles and shared experience than different, um, but I don't think anyone is ever saying that. Um, and you know, JK Rowling is who she is and um, you know, she's sharing her narrative with, um, about a community that does not get licensed to respond. Um, thanks to social media, we're able to respond. Um, but since the world sort of still views us as a monolith um, population, um, you know, it's, it's violent. It's, it's very violent to, to assault trans women in this particular way. That, like, you put it so perfectly, especially with, like, the world perceiving the trans community as a monolith, because even in the black community, like we continue to fight that, you know, if you have one black friend and they say something, then you think that like all black people are gonna agree because we have this one singular mind. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. Um, and like when I did dig a little bit more into the article that you posted, that you shared, um, it was interesting to see that like JK Rowling has publicly and vocally aligned herself with people who are vocally against trans people. You right. know what I mean? So that is to me the exact same as someone who is trying to fight racism being completely aligned with Trump, someone who aligns themselves with white nationalists. Right. Um, and so when I saw that, I was like, wow, I thought it was going to be a little bit more like um, subjective and like nuanced, you know what I mean? But it's pretty freaking clear, you know what I mean, that she has taken a stance against trans people, specifically, mm -hmm. like you said, trans women. Um, and um, reading through that article, it, it cited some uh, portions of her book, The Silkworm, in which she was so degrading to the trans character that she wrote into the book which is so interesting as a writer myself I'm like why would you write in a character just to talk down to them you know right unless unless and that's she, how you really feel about those people in general yeah and you know? she has the power right power and privilege to be able to do that um sort of to build that itself. community up yeah, yeah with the power of her pen she could actually build the trans community up but she chooses to uh 
to push them down and to talk down to them and to degrade. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I too am a huge Harry Potter fan, right? Like, um, I always identified with Hermione Granger's character. Actually, I always <laughs> thought I was a friend, though. I'm just going to say, I'm processing my grief about J.K. Rowling. <laughs> um, you know, I love Dumbledore. I love that she built a character. I actually was pulling up quotes um, from Dumbledore and how much they've been inspirational for me, right? And so I think what's, what's so tricky is that someone, right, I think the, the reason why we're so shell-shocked that it's a person like J.K. Rowling is because she is literally famous for creating an entire world, right, of which we have read into, watched the films, followed the, the, the stories and the, the offshoot stories and, you know, the Harry Potter mania and um, the war, the wizarding, wizarding world. And um, it's been such a part of our lives and such a huge fabric of fantasy and, and children's books and, um, right? And so, you know, as imaginative as she is, um, it is quite jarring to witness how closed-minded she is around um, the idea that trans people are authentic in who they are. Right, and so I think what I want people to know is that um, you're allowed to have complicated feelings um, as you go into learning about other people and other people's experiences. And I think that's what we're seeing specifically right now in our culture, um, in American culture and Western culture, we are seeing you know, violence against black people right and it's raw form that you cannot deny it that it's a injustice um and it violates human laws and humanity right and on the flip side um when we're talking about trans people you know we're seeing that institutions and people have consistently um disenfranchised trans people um, and I think as you're learning about gender identity and the experience of trans people, um, you will have complicated feelings. I think we all hold them because we live in a society that conditions us um, to believe in specifically a binary construct um, that women do this, men do that, um, and that any, any gender variance is off, right? Um, but those things aren't aren't real, right? Those are things that have been made up specifically for our society to continue mass producing and, and to follow particular roles. I think um, people should learn more about the experience of trans people, um, but I want to affirm, you know, in short, that uh, the reality is, is, is trans people are who they say they are. Um, it is very popular um in in western media and, and the world um to fixate and sensationalize our bodies um to present us as if we're mocking or imitating um cis women in particular and this is um this is a plight that trans women specifically face um we have to acknowledge that in our culture masculinity is deemed valuable um which is why um yeah, and it's part of patriarchy, sorry. And, um, you know, I think trans men, masculine women, um, folks on a spectrum of masculinity, it is socially accepted to, to embody that. Um, but when we think about femininity, um, and for those listening in, like, think about in your life how feminine people are policed, whether you're female sex assigned at birth, whether you're a, identify as a woman, a trans woman, um, as, a, as a feminine gay man, like whatever your experience is, like the, the, I, the idea of being feminine, you are policed in a certain way by other people, you are regulated. Um, you know, there's a whole industry that tells women and feminine people that they are not good enough. Uh, that they have to buy into something to cure that. There is consistently a war on all women um, in every part of the world. Every, every government, every country, no matter where you go, um, 
women are often considered second class citizens. Feminine people are considered bottom of the totem pole. And there is a reason for that. And so I think, you know, as someone who identifies as uh, into feminism, um, we have to liberate any feminine person. And when we do that, we make it so that cis women, trans women, gender non-conforming folks can actually come together um, and, and eradicate a culture that says that we're second class um, or that we're bottom of the totem pole. Oh my gosh, you just blew my mind with so many of the things that you said. But just even just on your last point, like, that's so true when you think about how women and feminine people are policed, even when it comes to like, fashion, you know, or like, if there's some sexual assault or something, it's like, what were you wearing? It's right. like, instead of policing the person that actually did the crime and, and caused the harm, we're policing what that person was wearing that made that violence okay. That something that that person was wearing excuses any violence or because yeah. that person is feminine, any violence that happens to them is acceptable. Or if, you know, at your workplace, if you are domineering as a feminine person, you get called a bitch, right? But if you're a, a masculine person, you get called ahead of the curve and a leader. Strong right? leader, um, exactly. You know, feminine people were policed about our bodies. If, if we're fat, plus size, you know, we are consistently told that our bodies do not conform. Even now, even now, we, even now when we have a variance of, of, uh, of people sort of coming forward and, and sharing their stories and, and celebrating their size or their bodies or their skin tones, we still consistently have conversations um, around our weight and our bodies that do not translate um, for masculine people. I think masculine people experience some of that, right? But it's, it's more about desirability than it is um, functioning or being seen as human, right? Like there's, whereas if you're feminine and fat or what have you, like there's- It dehumanizes you, yeah. Right. Stigma, stereotypes, um, belittling, discrimination. Like I think there has consistently been a war on women um, and a war on trans women, right? Um, and I think, yeah, folks are gonna have complicated feelings around gender. And I think um, that is the opportunity for you to read and decide for yourself what you believe in um, and, and to, to hear the stories of all different types of women. Um, you know, women of color, trans women, cis women that you, you know and acknowledge, um, you know, fat women, skinny women, whatever it is, um, you know, finding, finding ways to, to investigate your own subconscious beliefs around um, gender and, and who's allowed, right? Um, is definitely something I advocate for because, yeah, I think JK Rowling, again, like I said, she is entitled to believe whatever she wants to believe. At the end of the day, I don't pay her bills, <laughs> right? And so, but I do want, you know, I do want to acknowledge that I think the, the late, rhetoric that she's been doing is just consistently been violent um and very intentional um and it's it's really disappointing i agree i'm definitely disappointed i would encourage anyone who is interested to learn more about this to google it um i will once this goes live i'll be sharing articles and the things the articles that kind of inspired um this is a talking point and I just want to, before we wrap this whole JK Rowling thing up, I just want to say that the reason why I wanted to discuss it with you is because as someone who did grow up reading and listening to Harry Potter and watching it, it is difficult for me. Like you said, it's difficult to um, recognize that someone that you have thought of so fondly is problematic in ways. And especially with JK's story it is kind of like this Cinderella story of like this homeless single mother kind of like the American dream pulling herself up by her American bootstraps or she's from the UK anyway but right. um, pulling her up from her bootstraps and creating this kind of billion dollar idea this billion dollar brand off of this idea um, and so it is surprising coming from someone who you thought 
in a way kind of identified with a marginalized community to hear that she's so like blatantly being um, violent against trans women specifically. Um, and like you said, uh, she definitely like fixates on like body and, and specific things that are completely inappropriate and disturbing. And I think that for me, it's important to discuss this because as allies, it's hard for us to kind of marry the idea that like something that we've believed in for so long could be wrong or could be problematic. Um, and it's important for me to kind of acknowledge my privilege and the fact that I didn't know that she had these views. I didn't know that she's been saying this problematic stuff for years. And the reason why I didn't know that is because I'm not a trans person. And I've been, I've had the privilege to not know it and to be shielded by her hate because it doesn't affect me personally. And so that was the main reason why I wanted to talk about JK Rowling. First of all, I'm disappointed. And second of all, I think this is the perfect opportunity and example for us as allies to kind of come to terms with the fact that like the things that maybe we thought for so long were great, you know, like the the justice system or whoever is having issues realizing that like there's an issue in this country with racism like it might be difficult to acknowledge at first but sometimes you can't you can't turn a blind eye you know and for me this is an it, it, a perfect example of with jk rowling i can't turn a blind eye to her ignorance and to her hate and so hopefully others will look into this and be more educated about that the next thing I wanted to kind of get into, and this is kind of like the over, the overall like topic is you were saying that there's a war against trans women um, and there's a war against women specifically, but war against trans women. And I did a little research, um, the human rights campaign, um, the numbers for 2019 said that there were 26 trans and non-gender conforming people that were murdered in 2019 and so far there have been 14 trans or non-gender conforming people murdered in 2020 and so I want to kind of start this conversation off with those facts but now I kind of want to get into the Black Trans Lives Matter and start talking about some of the policy that we've been seeing in the headlines over the last week or two mm -hmm. um, and some of these things have been kind of skating by where some of these other things have been like super applauded and re awarded and, and super shared and all that kind of stuff. And so I would love to kind of get your perception on any of those things, or we can start right into um, the HUD with the, um, the homeless shelters and the single, uh, the single sex homeless shelters. Right. It's so much. Uh, we're such we're in such a complicated time at the moment. Um, and I think the great thing about this moment right now is that folks are awake, which is amazing, because I feel like so many years I've been doing this work. Sometimes it has felt like I've been talking to a wall. Um, and you know, folks will nod their head and what have you, and then. And then they forget about it, you know, the next day. And so it's it's really nice to see that folks are are seeing uh, what we've been saying. Um, Black trans lives matter. Um, why do we use that hashtag? I can start there. Um, we're using that hashtag right now because there has consistently been violence and disenfranchisement of Black trans women in the United States. Um, I can throw the numbers out to folks. Over 75% of Black trans women experience homelessness, right? Um, so many Black trans women experience carcer incarceration. Oftentimes the only employment opportunities that we have is survival sex trade. This is why when you are out and about in your lives, right now in COVID and after COVID and even before COVID, how many times did you see a Black trans person working at Starbucks? How many times did you see a Black trans person working um, at Safeway as your cashier or called you from a customer service call center about your late bill with Macy's credit card, right? Like how many times 
have you actually seen trans people employed in your workplace, right? And so the realities are we are significantly disenfranchised. Um, this has been since the dawn of time, um, and especially now. And I know that, you know, it, it's Pride season, um, and we are celebrating Pride. Um, I know that folks right now, if you're on Instagram, you're learning about how the reason Pride exists is because Black trans women did the fight at Compton's Cafeteria Riot or Stonewall in New York, um, in San Francisco, in LA, in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And the rest of the LGBT community is liberated because of the work and the fight of Black trans women, and they got left behind. We got left behind. Um, and so, you know, as you see campaigns and stuff for alcohol or basketball teams, whatever it is, know that <laughs> Black trans women have consistently been left out. And then um, we're experiencing a magnitude of violence. We're a very small population. So I know Annette was saying that the numbers, right? Um, which is around 30 or 40. But when you think about how small of a community that we are, um, that level of violence against us um, is, is it's, it's at a high magnitude. Um, and it impacts us, I think, greatly. And it shows that we fit, as a population in the United States, we fit a space of which we're experiencing high genocide against us for literally breathing. With that said, we've been using the hashtag Black Trans Lives Matter because, um, and this is no shade to the Black community, but there has not been a very visible stance from the movement for Black Lives and Black Lives Matter um, in talking about death against Black trans people. And, you know, it's very easy to dismiss because people are like, oh, it's nuanced. Um, these are one-off situations. Um, but it's not. It's consistent. Um, this week, uh, this past week, we've learned of the murder of Dominique um, and Rhea, um, two trans women. One of them, Dominique, um, was killed by a cis man. Um, her body was dismembered and chopped up into pieces and put into a suitcase. The, the, the amount of violence that we receive is also very gruesome. There's a video going around um, of a trans woman who survived her attack, Iana Dior, was in Minneapolis um, at a gas station near the protest um, and was attacked by 15 grown adult cis men. And she's actually a teenage trans person. And she would have died, right? She was being beat with the intention of killing her. If anyone has ever seen that video, um, many celebrities have shared it from like Megan Thee Stallion, Eva Marcio. I personally have not shared it because I, it just feels like trauma porn at this point. I think for some people, maybe it is educational and it activates them. But for many of us, it just feels like you're just watching violence against our bodies. But um, but yes, we are sirening out that enough is enough um, and that violence uh, from men, um, which all of our deaths have been at the hands of men, right? Um, all the violence that we've seen towards trans women have been at the hands of men. Um, and enough is enough. Um, it's very easy for a lot of folks to go to a space of like, you know, oh, well, these girls are tricking people into deceiving them into believing no one is being deceived. <laughs> I just want to clarify that. Like, I see that on the Shade Room and Media Takeout and World Star. You know, this is not new. Many people will flood the comments with, with, well, you can't tell the difference these days or whatever. All of it is a big lie. It's a very popular place to go to. Um, but, it, you know, these people know that, that we're trans. Um, and I think that's something that we have to understand and we have to process um, in our minds and, and stop being married to this idea that, that trans women are responsible or deserving of their murder, right? Um, and in particular, black trans women. So 
that's why we're using that hashtag. Um, and so if you click on that hashtag on Instagram or Facebook, you'll see a host of different thought leadership um, and ideas around supporting uh, the lives um, and the sanctity of life for Black trans people. Um, for what's going on right now, um, you know, the Supreme Court of the United States, um, the fact that we're ha even having to, de to debate in 2020, whether it is illegal or legal to discriminate against um, a queer person or a trans person at their work, at their place of employment, is crazy to me. It is insane. But yes, the Supreme Court for the last year has been deciding whether it is legal or illegal to discriminate against a queer person or specifically a trans person um, at their workplace. Um, this case was led by um, Amy Stevens, um, who was a trans woman in the Midwest. Um, she transitioned on her job. Um, her employer said that it was against their beliefs um, to have her work there as a trans person um, and that the, her gender presentation was distracting. Now, I want people to know she worked at a funeral home. So who was distracting in the morgue? I'm just saying, like, <laughs> it's crazy. So the ACLU took her case. Shout out to Chase. Um, Chase is the attorney. Um, he is a trans man himself. Um, he uh, works with the ACLU and um, he took on her case to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, Amy Stevens did not get to see her victory. She died a month ago. Um, and she passed away of natural causes, but, um, but yeah, she died a month ago, um, before this case got approved. And so she, I guess, spent the last part of her life wondering if it was legal to discriminate against her, um, which is unfortunate. Um, at the same time, um, the Trump administration um, has been quite married to um, abolishing any protections. The small level of protections that we did get from the Obama administration, shout out to my forever president, <laughs> President and, and Michelle Obama, um, and Barack Obama, sorry, I said that wrong, but <laughs> I want Michelle Obama to be president. I think it'll just cure everything. Um, but I know that she's tired and she doesn't want to do that fight. Um, yeah, she's with, like, bye. No, bye. <laughs> she's like, no thanks. <laughs> um, but with the Trump administration from the beginning, um, this president and, and Mike Pence have been very intentional um, in, in creating institutional violence and, and facilitating institutional violence towards trans people. It started with uh, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. As we know, trans people are a marginalized group. Um, this president chose to ban the word transgender in any public health discourse. Um, so when we say it's a state of emergency um, for trans people and our bodies and our access to health, know that at the beginning of his presidency, um, he was intentionally banning any content, any conversation um, that had to do with transgender people. From there, we've seen several states just discuss this bathroom policy. I'm not gonna dig into that, that's a whole nother thing. But as of this week, uh, Trump has been successful in officially taking away uh, healthcare protections for transgender people and the Affordable Care Act and encouraging um, medical professionals, doctors, nurses, um, EMTs, paramedics, um, that they have license to discriminate against transgender people and uh, because of their body. And then at that same week, um, Ben Carson, I think that's his name, um, he is currently running HUD, um, which is the federal housing program. And this is important to note because this specific department within the federal government oversees all affordable housing. It sets the standards that you have XYZ windows in your house, that you have running water, that you have um, electricity in your house. Like this is the department in the federal government that dictates what humane housing is. 
I want people to understand why this is actually really significant um, and really violent. This is an institution within the federal government that dictates, um, you know, housing for everyone, that houses should have windows and running water and electricity and what have you. And they have come forward and said that homeless shelters and affordable housing programs that receive funding from this department should be prohibiting trans people from being residents of homeless shelters, of domestic violence programs, of, of subsidized affordable housing units, et cetera. Um, specifically and 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 really encouraging um those providers to not house us i know it's very easy in our in our world you know with access to internet if you are not immediately impacted by poverty um if you're not currently living in your car or in a shelter you know it's very easy to be like to to to, to not have a window into what that experience is like but usually when you are homeless um, and living in abject poverty, a homeless shelter or a soup kitchen is the only resource, resource that you have, right? Um, until you can get a state benefit or, you know, welfare or what have you to get on your feet. This is really important to think about because we're saying that the only lifeline that is provided to folks in our communities that are homeless have a right to ban trans people from using that lifeline resource, specifically a resource that we all pay taxes into. <laughs> Sorry, I just want people to know like the severity of this. And so it's a mixed bag of emotions because for me in my own personal life, I feel like I'm experiencing very high highs and very low lows. Um, progress is never linear. Um, the Supreme Court um, ruling that it is illegal to discriminate against a trans or queer person based on their gender identity or their sexual orientation um, or their presentation of gender um, was surprising, quite frankly, because this administration and this era um, that we have been in has really created um, a toxic culture um, and rhetoric around trans people. And I think, you know, it's very easy to talk about how negative Trump is, um, but Trump is also very influential and very powerful. And so whenever these rulings come out um, or these decisions or his tweets around trans people, know that there's a domino effect, that there are civilian citizens who feel activated to enact violence against trans people because this individual said it was okay. This person holding the highest office in the world said it was permissible to discriminate against a group of people. Wow, that is, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think one thing that will also bring the like HUD info home to people is like you even shared earlier that I think you said something like 70% of trans uh, women are homeless. Over 70%, yeah. Yeah, so you're saying over 70% of trans women are homeless. And what this administration has, do has done is they've created a process where if you're going to a homeless shelter that's for women, you have to be biologically born that way to be accepted into that homeless shelter. Um, and for a community with such a high homeless um, percentage, it definitely has do, been, been done intentionally. Like there's no way that they don't know these numbers. There's no way that they don't see how that is negatively impacting the trans community. Um, and so that was something that I didn't know until I uh, read that article that you shared. And it definitely affects so many people and I think it's important for us to know um, like the importance of our voting for the people in these highest of offices and for our governors and for you know our senators and stuff. It's important to know kind of where they fall on these things and to keep those things in mind when we're voting. Uh, because if not, it's gonna be another, you know, I think almost 60 years uh, because the whole Supreme Court thing, 
that was supposed to be included in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said that you can't discriminate against people based on their sex or sexual orientation. Um, and now for the last year, as, as you said, it's been up to the Supreme Court, but it's been over 50 years that this should have been applied to sexual identity, all of these different things. But that is why it, our words are so important, especially when we're looking at legal documents. Um, words are very, very important. Um, even as we were talking before about pronouns and things like this and how with allyship over time, things change, words change. Um, there's new ideas and new movements that require us to be able to shift not only our perspective, but also uh, the way that we speak. And so, yeah, to me, it was very interesting that it took, you know, over 50 years for our Supreme Court to approve something that was brought uh, to them in 1964 uh, to make it illegal to discriminate against people at work. But we're still here where it's legal to discriminate against people with um, health care and health insurance um, and with home, with housing. So I wanted to have this part of the discussion just to say, yeah, it's great the Supreme Court is, you know, surprising us and um, making some good decisions. But we also have to keep our eyes on the prize and know that there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and you've just shed so much light on that whole topic for me. Before we wrap this up, I want to ask kind of like what you're working on, um, if you have any events coming up, and how we can support you going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for those listening in, um, if this part of the conversation became an affirmation of, oh shit, the world has gone to shit, what am I supposed to do as an ally or as a listener? Um, I think the biggest thing that you can do at the moment is, is look into what we just talked about um, and look into the, the conversations around um, trans people and um, our rights um, and, and, and lack thereof. And, and, and find ways to be engaged um, and, and to vote, not just during the presidential season, right? It's very easy to just kind of vote every four years, but the, um, the biggest thing that you can do is actually focus on your local area. And those votes, uh, those, those ballots happen um, the other years that the president is not being elected, right? Um, and so who's on your city council? Who is your mayor? Who are your House of Representative folks? Who are your senators? Those are the people that enact policy, law, et cetera. Um, your president is not as influential as you think. Um, they can be a siren for certain things, um, but we live in a republic, right? We always say democracy, but we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Um, and we have three branches of government. So we have judicial, executive, and legislative. Um, your legislative branch is probably your most important because if you have a progressive Congress and House of Representatives, then you'll have progressive laws um, that are veto-proof. Um, and that's energy that we should be talking more about um, in our homes and, and with our families and friends. Um, the work that I get to do every day and wake up doing um, that I'm really proud of um, is, is, is empowering trans people um, and finding ways to address our disparity uh, that we face, but also really promote to you all and, and, and audiences across the world about how um, trans people are some of the most beautiful people um, and we are resilient, we are powerful. Uh, we have a sophisticated culture that I think people don't know how greatly we have contributed to pop culture um, in so many ways. And um, that's what my, my work is about. Um, and so many Black trans-led um, projects is um, that we are allowed to be complex. So while we face a great magnitude of oppression and violence, and, and, and I know I can make it sound, um, you know, very sad and soft, and, and it is, 
um, right? But we also know how to have joy and have fun. And, 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 and yeah, I think um, so many trans women of color just inspire me um, to try to live my best life and my own life. Um, and so that's what my work is all about um, with the Transgender District. Um, we are focusing on economic empowerment um, and how we can sort of help cure or be a radical solution um, towards the economic disenfranchisement we face. So I was saying earlier, you know, looking around in your city, wherever you are, um, and seeing, paying attention to how many trans people you see at these workplaces, the reality is, is people don't hire us, right? I have been on many interviews um, and gotten laughed at and teased and um, belittled or misgendered, um, made fun of um, at many different employers and, and not gotten a job. And, you know, when you're interviewing for a job, it's very hard to prove whether it was discrimination or not, right? And so our goal at the Transgender District is, okay, well, if you all won't hire us, then we're gonna help trans people who wanna start businesses and who are making a commitment to hiring other trans people so that we become more economically stable um, as a community. Um, we are working towards uh, addressing housing equity um, in San Francisco and housing inequity for trans people. Um, and that's the work that we do with uh, the trans district right now. Um, and with Queen Culture, excuse me, uh, with Queen Culture, um, it's empowerment um, based. And so we're doing a workshop with Sephora um, for Pride um, for trans and gender nonconforming folks. Um, and so if you go to our Instagram at Queen Culture, K-W-E-E-N-C-U-L-T-U-R-E. -E. Um, you can learn more information about our partnership with Sephora and doing like um, classes for confidence on self-esteem and um, boosting your self-esteem through makeup or skincare or what have you. Um, and yeah, in the we're in a COVID world right now, so we're doing a lot of virtual hangout sessions. Um, and normally we put on an empowerment retreat uh, where we do workshops on specifically on self-esteem um, and self-care for black trans activists. Um, and so we're hoping we might be able to do it in the fall, but um, those are some things coming up. Um, and tuning in to Global Pride, um, where you'll see uh, thought leaders like myself, uh, Raquel Willis, um, Alicia Garza, who is a founder of Black Lives Matter, um, and so many more. When is Global Pride? Ooh. I think it's June 24th. Ha 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 ha. Is it? I'm, pre I'm pretty sure it's June 24th. Okay, let me double check. Hold yeah. On. I was just going to be like, when is it? But I'm pretty sure it's June 24th. It is June 27th. Okay, I lied. June 27th. I just Googled it. Um, so it's Saturday, June 27th. Um, all you gotta do is go on YouTube and it'll be on the front page. Awesome. Well, oh my gosh, Aria, this was such an incredible conversation. I learned so much. I'm so happy to finally meet you face to face in this nice. COVID world, as you put it. But this was a great conversation. I'm happy to just kind of get the conversation started. I really want to um, walk the talk and definitely have you and others um, included in the work that I'm doing and get myself more included because um, as a marginalized person, I already know how that feels, but the more I talk to other people in um, even more marginalized communities, um, I realize that their biggest issue is that like no one ever acknowledges their existence it's you know what i mean like people don't even invite them to tell their story people yeah. don't even take the time to listen to them tell their story um and that's something that i can do and that's something that i know is really important to all of us is to feel heard and to to feel seen so um that's the very least that we can do and so this is just kind of a step in that direction but again, I want to thank you so much. I learned so much. Is there anything that you want to say before we wrap it up? 
Oh, follow me on Instagram. I forgot that part. But yeah, that's it. And, and they- your Instagram again, is it uh, Trans oh, District? Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay. my personal account is um, at Aria Said. It's Saeed, but S-A-I-D. Um, A-R-I-A-S-A-I-D. Um, and then, of course, the Transgender District is on Instagram um, and Queen Culture as well. Um, and yeah, that's it. Perfect. Well, happy <laughs> Thank Pride. You. Thank you. <laughs> of course. I'm so happy to have you. Happy Pride. So excited to just get this conversation started. Can't wait to see what else comes from this. And, you know, just take care of yourself. Try to have a good day. But be sure to, like, take care of your mental health because that's where I'm focusing right now, girl. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. No.